new life. Let's look in John. Drew from Christmas and now the New Year's in John. My favorite gospel. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for the fear of who? Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending what? You. You. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Friends, how many church services will we have to attend? How many sermons do we need to hear for God to finally get our attention? You see, with every sermon that you hear and every scripture that you read and every single song that you sing, it is the Holy Spirit pursuing you. When you sit down and read the Bible, you're not going there, I hope, for just information. Man, you're going there for recreation. I am amazed at how many times God has pursued me. Man, the more I kept on running, hallelujah, Jesus kept on coming. John chapter 20, the disciples are huddled behind locked doors alone and they're confused and they're afraid, but hallelujah, then Jesus Christ shows up. The church is hiding. They missed the resurrection, and so the resurrected Savior has to come and find them, and He finds them huddled behind closed doors, afraid and frightened. Which tells me no matter how short you may have fallen this past year, no matter how much you may have missed the mark, God still wants to give you new life. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. What better way to start a new year than to talk about new life? Uh, Because you see, years come and years go and resolutions come and resolutions go and your determination to uh, eat better and live better and and go to the gym more, sometimes sadly that comes and that goes. The part of the time I dread going to the gym, I love going to the gym, but I, I, I cannot stand January and February at the gym. Can't find a machine in the place, but you just hold on till March. <laughs> and I can get any gym equipment I want. Uh, so, so more than talk about New Year's resolutions, friends, start claiming your new life in Jesus Christ. We can't do anything outside of Jesus Christ. You see, a new life in Christ is something that is unshakable. It's untouchable. No one can mess with your new life in Jesus. And so it's my prayer that this next year, every member of College Drive will experience new life. Well, in studying the Sabbath for this message, I found there are two prerequisites for new life. The Word of God and the Spirit of God. You see, the Spirit of God plus uh, the, the, the Spirit of God plus the Word of God equals life. You see, that's the way it has always been from the very beginning. That's how God operates and how He creates. Let's look at it. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the who? And the Word was with? And the Word was? All right, so here we have the Word in the very beginning. This is the Word of God. And then we read in the Genesis story, the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was doing what? Hovering. He was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, that is the Word of God, let there be light. And there was what? Spirit of God plus Word of God ignites light. Life. Life. Genesis 2-7 tells us also, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust uh, from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Uh, This same word, breath of life, is for the Holy Spirit. The same word. 
But then we know how the story goes. Sin came and it brought death and it brought decay. And so what you find is the rest of the Bible from Genesis 3 on is a story about God trying to give new life to a creation that is dying. That is dying. That is dying. You see, God wanted to do through Abraham what his descend, what, 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 and, and, and through Abraham's descendants what Adam was unable to do and failed to do. And, and God wanted to do through the disciples what Israel had failed to do. You see, throughout the Bible we have these examples. This Genesis story keeps reappearing. The story of God trying to give His people life. They keep choosing death. And just like the earth was without form and void and the Spirit moved and new life appeared, so it is with us. David talks about it. He says, when I was born, behold, I was what? Shapen in what? You see, when we are born, when we... Uh, before we encounter Christ, we are without form. We are void of life until the Spirit of God moves and the Word of God speaks. Look at the Bible. Man, Israel was a mess before God began working. Abraham was a mess before God started working. And Jacob was a mess. And Isaac was a mess. And the disciples were a bunch of messes, which gives me hope because we're often a mess too, aren't we? But God specializes in messes. Uh, In fixing messes. You see, even when we are at our worst, God sees the best. That is what's amazing to me about God. Heaven looks past our shortcomings. Heaven looks past our DNA. It does not look at where we are today, but where we will be after the Word of God speaks and the Holy Spirit moves. You see, before the earth was created, if you would just look with your naked eye, all you would have seen was chaos, uh, darkness, and void. But God saw a planet brimming with life. And so creation is proof that when God looks at you, He doesn't see you as you are, but He sees you as He wants to take you. Years ago, God did not see me as a junkie in the alley, but as a child of God one day stepping into glory. He knew what I could become if I would just shut up and listen to the Word speak and let the Spirit move. Even when the church is at its worst, God sees us at our best and what our potential and what we can become. You see, He wants to turn the gossip sharing and the constant complaining into gospel declaring and kingdom proclaiming. The disciples spent three and a half years with the Word of God, but now they need the Spirit of God in order to come alive. John 4.24 confirms this. It says those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and the Word. Because only spirit plus truth equals life. Truth without spirit is dead. Uh, Just as spirit without truth is dead. So I may say that I am a born again Christian, but if I am blatantly ignoring the Word of God, I'm really dead. And if I have the Word of God, but it doesn't manifest itself in love and godly spirit, then I am also dead. Word plus spirit equals life. In the beginning, if the Word had not spoken, but the Spirit moved, no life. In the beginning, if the Word had spoken, but the Spirit did not move, there would have been no life. This is why the disciples are hiding, scared, behind closed doors, because God has not yet breathed on them. John 20, 21, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. You see, this is is what amazes me about God. God is ready to send out the disciples. After He finds them hiding behind closed doors, He's ready to send the disciples. After they royally mess up, He's ready to send the disciples. That is completely opposite of the way that we operate. I mean, we compiled this list of things people must do in order for them to just join the church. 
We want them to dress right, and we want them to eat right, and we want them to live right. But what about being nice? (laughs) What about being nice? Man, we will let someone join the church who looks like us and eats like us and worships like us, even if they're as mean as a snake. But to a kind-hearted person who may be struggling in a particular area in their life, we just can't tolerate that. We cannot lower our standards to accept that. A new requirement for College Drive membership should be you have to love God and love people. you got to be nice. <laughs> got to be nice. Look at how Jesus assembled his leadership team. Let's see how the master did it. Matthew 10.1, we have the calling of the disciples. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them what? Power. Another word used here is authority. So let's look at this list of, uh, that God gives to this, to this godly group of Seventh-day Adventists. He calls Peter. Peter has a big mouth and a small brain. James and John are gang bangers, literally. They're called the sons of thunder. Thomas doesn't trust or believe anything anyone says, including Jesus. Matthew is a white collar crook, he exploits his own people. Simon the Zealot is an insurrectionist. A zealot, that's what he did. He insurrected, basically, he was a terrorist. Philip is a racist. Remember when he hears Jesus came from Nazareth? He said, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Well, Philip, your Savior just came from Nazareth. And it's this group of misfits that Jesus assembles to give new life and to be his church. And and, and he even has the audacity in their messed up condition to give them authority and power. And this is why, friends, the minute people become members of the church, I'm not saying we ordain them as elders, but we give them authority and power to serve God because that's what Jesus did with the disciples. The second we call someone, we've got to give them power to witness, to share their love, to serve God in a way that God has gifted them to serve. And then at the Last Supper, they're fighting over who's going to be in charge. And again, I can't get over that. This isn't the first supper. You would expect that at the first supper. This is the last supper. He's been with them three and a half years, and you've got Judas with money burning a hole in his pocket, and Peter has a sword poking out of his, and, and they're about to take communion. And yet Jesus still chooses to use this group. Because you see, God wants to demonstrate to College Drive, look, you don't have to be somebody before you come to me. You can be a nobody and I'll make you somebody. Because you see, the Spirit of God specializes in moving over nothing and turning it into something. It hovers over the void and the void comes to life. And so after Jesus gives them power, he sends them out. The gangbangers, he he sends out. And the white collar crooks, he sends out. And the racists, he sends them out to do ministry. He doesn't say, work out these details and then I'll put you to work. He says, I'll put you to work. And in the process of you working for me, I'm going to work out those issues in your life. I'm going to break down of these issues. I'm going to break them down. Because you know, the greatest way to empty us of of, of ourselves, and, 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 and Mike, in your prayer, it was beautiful. Empty us of ourselves so you can fill us with your spirit. And the greatest way that God empties us of ourselves is by getting us to do things for others. Jesus knew he could not give the disciples new life without getting them involved in the lives of others. This is what church is really about. Friends, this is why we feed the homeless. It's so God can empty us. This is why we host the visitor's lunch. It's so that God can empty us. And so what if some people do the visitor's lunch better than others, or some people do this ministry better than others, and it's not quite the way you want. What you don't know is God is working behind the scenes, and He is working on that leader and that individual, and He's emptying them of themselves. 
don't get in the way of the Holy Spirit. It's why we lead small groups and we invite people into our homes and, and we invite someone uh, who, who we've never had to our house over for Sabbath lunch. It's easy to have the same people we know we get along with over for Sabbath lunch. Invite someone you've never met before over to Sabbath lunch in your home. Pray for people. It's why we do Bible studies. You see, all these things are emptying you of your greatest problem, which is you. God can't give us new life until He gets rid of the old. You see, after three and a half years, the Word of God was with the disciples, and the disciples still had no life. They listen and they see Jesus do the impossible, and yet they remain basically unchanged. Why? Well, because the Word of God needs the Spirit of God to yield new life. And this is why you can be in the church your entire life and, and you can never change. It's why you can hide out in the pews and never change. Because you see, John 4, 24 is clear. If you worship Him, you got to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Not just the Word. Not just the Spirit. But the Word plus the Spirit equals life. The disciples kept looking for love and fulfillment in all the wrong, in all the wrong places. And, and we do the same thing. You know, if the conference could just send us the right pastor. But the disciples were with Jesus three and a half years. It's not about what kind of pastor you have. It's about what kind of Christian you are. No pastor can give College Drive new life. It's only when College Drive lets the Word speak and the Spirit move that it will have new life. But pastor, we've never done it that way. We'll let the Spirit move. But pastor, we can't afford that. It's too expensive. Let the Spirit move. But pastor, she's still doing this and he's still doing that. Well, then get out of the way and let the Spirit move. In the final hours of Jesus' life, the church is doing what too often the church does, and that's they're fighting. And friends, sadly, in the end, the church all forsook Him and fled. After three and a half years with the Word, they're still dead. How many years do we have to go through before we let God give us new life? How many pastors does, do we have to go through in order for God to give us new life? How many sermons do we have to adhere for God to give us new life for us to just get out of the way and let the Spirit move? Do you know what it finally took for the disciples to get out of the way? It took the cross. You see, they thought they were ready, but they were not ready. You are not ready for the cross, Peter. But the moment the disciples heard the Word of God speak from Calvary, reality came crashing in and they saw just how strong they were absent of God. You see, Calvary empties us of our pretense. Calvary empties us of our pride and our prejudice. Calvary empties us of our license. It empties us of this idea that we deserve anything because Calvary tells me the only thing I deserve is death, yet instead of death, God is giving me new life. The only thing that can ever empty us is the cross. Because the cross tells me that I am so wicked, I am so sinful. Richie Halverson is so wicked that God had to die in order to pay for my sin. And yet the cross also tells me that I am so loved and cherished by God that He was willing to do it. Only the cross can empty us. You see, a tree exposed Adam and Eve and sent them hiding in the Garden of Eden. And it was a tree on Calvary that exposed the disciples and sent them hiding. And I have often wondered... If Jesus was disappointed when He woke up Resurrection Sunday. I have often wondered if Jesus was disappointed coming up out of the tomb. You know, did He anticipate my disciples are going to be on the other side of this and I'm going to wake up and I'm going to see Peter and I'm going to see John and I'm going to see Andrew and I'm going to see Bartholomew. I'm going to see my disciples. And He wakes up and no one was there to welcome Him. No one was there to witness Him 
coming forth in the miracle. And he had told them time and time again, three days later, the Son of Man will rise up. But they missed it. Why? Well, because they were hiding. Friends, some of us are hiding right now. Some of us hide in position. Some of us hide in success. Some of us hide in, in our accomplishments. Some of us hide in our lack of commitment. We're not willing to commit to anything except for ourselves. Some of us hide out in, 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 in our addictions and our justifications. And some of us hide in our illusions of control. Which is why daily we need the Word of God to empty us so the Holy Spirit can fill us. Friends, I love my church. I know this is God's remnant church. I know this is God's end time church. I know that this is the last stop on the block for me until I step into glory. But sometimes I get worried about my church. We seem sometimes to lean so heavily on the truth we know, we neglect leaning on the Holy Spirit we don't know. But only the Word of God plus the Spirit of God equals life. You see, there's too much pride in even being a Seventh-day Adventist. There's too much pride in even keeping the Sabbath and paying your tithe and too much pride in being in the truth. But you see, the truth has to be in you. You see, none of those things, even as essential and as necessary and as, and as binding as they are, are going to save you. None of those things, as essential as they are, can give you new life. They're a part of your new life, but they don't give you new life. I've had people come up to me when family have died, and I'm sure you've had them say some variance of this. Uh, they say, I sure hope they died in the truth. And you know, I can't help but think, what truth are you talking about? Because there's only one truth I've done read in my Bible that will save you, and that's God, Jesus Christ, living inside of you. Friends, there's going to be plenty of Sabbath keepers who know all 28 fundamental beliefs who sadly are lost for all eternity. But there's not going to be one person who loved God with all their heart who is left out of the gates. Amen. Sometimes we wear our righteousness like it's an Armani suit and the Bible tells us it's filthy rags. And so God's got to empty us so that He can fill us. It's a powerful verse I read this past week. The joy of our hearts has ceased. Our dancing has been turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. You see, the disciples are hiding. They jump at every knock at the door. They're uncharacteristically quiet. But check this out. It's then that Jesus shows up. And he shows up in their darkest moment and he says to them, not, what are you, you idiots doing hiding? He doesn't say to them, you messed up. Why aren't you already doing this? And why are you still doing that? And why are you not, why, why are you still wearing those? No, he says, peace be with you. They deserted him in Gethsemane and he says, peace be with you. Peter denied him, peace be with you. They missed the resurrection and Jesus says, peace be with you. Friends, did you mess up this last year? Jesus' words to you right now is, peace be with you. And then He breathed on them the Holy Ghost. The Word emptied them so that the Spirit could fill them and now they are new creations in Christ. And just as the Word breathed on Adam and Eve in the beginning and they came to life, so Jesus, the Word, breathes on the disciples and they come to life. And alive they came. You keep reading your Bible. Just read the next book, Acts of the Apostles. should be called Acts of the Holy Spirit rather than Acts of the Apostles. But every other verse is about what the Holy Spirit can do if you would just get out of the way and give Him room to move. Check it out. Acts 1.15, there's 120 in the group. Acts 2.41, 3,000 are added. Acts 4.4, 4, 5,000 are added. And then they just can't even count the numbers anymore and they just record multitudes were added. 
That's what the church can do when we give it, when we give the Spirit some room to move. Only the Word of God plus Spirit of God equals life. But soberingly, when we get to chapter 6, the mood changes slightly. And it says, now in these days, when the disciples were what? A complaint arose. I have seen this happen my entire life. When the church starts filling up with people and people start filling up with the Holy Ghost, people start complaining. You want, you want to know the greatest sign that you're still holding on to your old life? When you can't get along with other church people. The Seventh-day Adventist church is God's remnant church, which means the dragon has declared war on you. And the greatest way the devil attacks, and we're going to be talking about it over the coming weeks, is by dividing us. You see, new life doesn't always mean that we agree. New life doesn't mean that we don't have struggles. New life doesn't mean you always like what the pastor does. And new life doesn't mean I always like what you do. And new life doesn't mean we don't sometimes mess up. New life does not mean we don't have struggles. New life just means that our love for each other and our love for God is stronger than those disagreements and struggles. We don't look at each other as problems to be fixed. We look at ourselves as individuals made in the image of our Creator and we've got to love each other in spite of each other. Ellen White made this powerful statement. Powerful. I read it this week. Men of different temperaments can walk side by side if they but follow the captain of their salvation. The melancholies can get along with the sanguines. Phlegmatics can get along with the cholerics. We can get along and move forward if we keep Jesus at the center. In 2015, friends, let us keep the prize ahead of us. And the prize is Jesus Christ. Let's listen to the Word speak and let's let the Spirit move. If we do this, friends, I'm telling you, we will see more miracles in the next year than we've seen the past hundred years combined. It isn't maybe, it isn't might. The Bible has guaranteed it. It will happen. Do you want new life? Let the Word empty you so that the Spirit can fill you. Maybe that means taking a stand for the truth. Truth that you know you need to stand up for the Sabbath and you need to become a part of a church family that's teaching the Sabbath. Uh, not as a way, uh, you're not obeying in order to, in, 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 in order to uh, get God's love. You got God's love, so you obey because you got God's love. Maybe it means being more kind and loving to people and being patient. You can't ignore the Word and receive new life, nor can you receive new life without being filled with the Holy Spirit. So we have to worship Him in spirit and truth. You see, the disciples are proof of this. In the beginning, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. This was the first day of creation. What day was Jesus resurrected? First day. And on the evening of the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, they were in the darkness, they were hiding. Jesus came and stood among them, the light of the world, and said, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. The Word of God plus the Spirit of God equals life. And friends, like the disciples, we live in a time of darkness. Right now, there are members that are experiencing a darkness they've never experienced before. But very soon, friends, in our darkest moment, Jesus, hallelujah, is going to show up. 
The disciples missed the resurrection because they were hiding. But when the Word spoke and the Spirit moved, they came alive in Christ. And these same people who forsook Him and fled are new people now. Uh, Peter uh, will be crucified upside down. And Paul is beheaded. And James is killed just a few years after Jesus leaves. And John is thrown in boiling oil and he's in prison. Thomas is killed in India. And Matthew is killed in Ethiopia. You see, they missed Jesus' resurrection because they were hiding in the dark, but then the Spirit moved, and now nothing is going to keep them from the next resurrection. When they can see their Savior face to face, they have new life. What about you? Friends, I want 2015 to be the year I listen to the Word speak more, and I let the Spirit move more in my life so that I can have new life. I don't want Jesus to find me hiding at the next resurrection. But I want Him to hear me say, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for Him. That He might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. Let us be glad and rejoice in salvation. Do you want to claim that promise today? Amen. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You and we praise You for Your goodness and mercy. We come to You in this moment, in this hour, and we ask and we pray for an outpouring of Your Holy Spirit on our lives. We've heard the Word speak. Now we want to let the Spirit move. We want to give You room to move in our lives and in our home and in our church and in everywhere. Fear will try to keep us from going forward. But Lord, we know that perfect love casts out all fear. We're going to give the Spirit room to move in our life this next year. That 2015 might be the year that the church finishes the work You've called us to do, that You've been waiting for us to do and we can experience ultimate new life. Lord, we long when the Jesus will come again, and we know that time is coming soon. We long for the day when You will wipe away the tears from our eyes. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. The former things are done away with. Behold, all things are new. Lord, there are people here struggling. There are people here who are hurting. Lord, I pray that we invite You to move in our lives. You can hover over the darkness and say, let there be light and there will be light. And we can step forward in 2015 with new life. May we commit to doing greater things for You. May we commit to becoming more vulnerable for You. May we commit to giving You all of our heart this year. We thank You. We praise You in Jesus' name. The name above all names. Amen.